The story of books begins with the development of graphic communication. Writing began with the first picture symbols scratched on stone and developed into the sophisticated alphabets of today. Writing appears to have been developed between the 7th and 4th millennium BC. Wood would be the first medium to take the guise of a book. Clay tablets were first used in Mesopotamia. They utilized a tool called the calamus to make characters in the moist clay. The tablets would then be fired and left to dry. Papyrus was used as early as the first dynasty in Egypt. They took the form of scrolls of several sheets of paper, pasted together up to 10 meters or more in length. Text occupied one side and was divided into columns. Uh, in China, uh, writing on bone, shells, wood, and silk existed long before the 2nd century BC. The Greeks created large libraries for the preservation and collection of books during the Hellenistic period. Libraries in Alexandria, Pergamon, Athens, and Rhodes, and Antioch were all devoted to this practice. They also worked to create many copies of books. Book censorship and burning of books took place as early as during the Roman Empire. The Codex was the first book to take the form of bound leaves or pages. They came into general use in Europe during the 9th century. A form of the Codex was developed by the Aztecs, though few survive today. Until the fall of Rome, papyrus had been the common material of, used for books, until parchment progressively replaced it. The finest quality parchment was known as vellum, and was made using the skin of animals. Paper making was brought to the West in the 8th century. As far as we know, though, it was not linked to the Asian craft, which developed in China around the 1st century AD. Texts were produced using woodblock printing and was driven by the dispersion of Buddhist texts. The first printed books in China started to develop during the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907 AD. During the Middle Ages, the scriptorum became the center of book publishing. These were the workrooms of monk copyists, where books were copied, decorated, rebound, and conserved. Copying was a way for the text to circulate around the monasteries and for monks to perfect their religious education. Copying had several phases. First, the preparation of the manuscript, then the preservation of pages, copying itself, revision or correction of errors, decoration, and finally binding. The revival of cities in the 12th century in Europe brought new demands for books. Universities became the centers for book production, as demand expanded for reference materials for students. Here, writing in the common vernacular developed. The commercial scriptura became common, and the profession of bookseller came into being. The most influential thing to affect the distribution of books was the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in 1440. No longer written or reproduced by request, book publication became an enterprise. Facilitated by this invention, distribution increased and prices decreased. Originally printed in Latin, this, though the spread of vernacular printing was a slower process. In 1455, the Gutenberg Bible was the first major book printed in Europe with movable metal type. Book printing became widespread in Europe. Though in Asia, a complex alphabet and social conditions had discouraged the process. Within 50 years, presses spread throughout the major cities of Europe. In 1535, the first press was established in Mexico, though another century would pass before appearing in the rest of North America. La Escala Espiritual de San Juan Climatco was the first book printed in North America. Up until the early 19th century, the printer was publisher and bookseller, working with presses not much different from Gutenberg's. They became increasingly involved with the complexities of publishing until it was impractical to operate these functions and craft the printing. In 1815, with the development of the steam press, printing became a major business itself. The steam press was capable of devouring all of the handmade paper produced very quickly.
Paper making machines were then developed to meet the demand of the new printers. In 1838, the development of mechanical typecasting meant mass production of books was possible. Book prices again dropped and were made more widely accessible. Bibliographic features like positioning and formulation of titles and subtitles were also affected. Early printers were confined to only a few basic typefaces. But with the advent of new printing technology, machine-age printers had types of every description, the result being typographic chaos. In 1890, a reaction against machine-made monstrosities led to William Morris of England reviving the handcrafts of Divine, Updike, and Rogers, and restoring the typography of the 17th and 18th centuries. This introduced the mature printing traditions to machine technology. In 1886, the last bottleneck in printing was eliminated by the perfection of typesetting machinery. The separation of printer and publisher, which began in the 19th century, was far advanced by the beginning of the 20th century thanks to the advancements in printing technology. The new distribution of books meant the need for more protective covers. The transition was made from paper to full-color jackets. Books themselves had changed very little in the past 400 years, but jackets evolved entirely during the 20th century. The distinction between printer and typographer and designer took form also during this period. Technical developments permitted a wide range of expression in book design to attract some full-time designers. World War II would bring the development of high-speed production of paperbacks, as they were a military need. This paved the way for post-war expansion of paperback publishing. Also during the 1940s, paperbacks began being distributed through magazine outlets. This was made possible through very large printings enabling lower cost and low retail prices. These tended toward westerns and mysteries with a maximum pictorial appeal on the outside and little attention to design on the inside. Gradually, though, the publishers and magazine distributors began to treat titles with more enduring interest as books. Anchor Books realized that there was a market for paperback classics within colleges. The 1950s show signs of response to the 20th century aesthetics. The design of paperbacks and book jackets led the way. Most marked development was in the realm of textbooks and children's books, which was a rapidly expanding market. Competition drove publishers to use heavy uses of color and illustration. Initially, the competition was over the amount, but later was over the quality. Throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, new types of documents would emerge which would rival the printed book, such as photography, sound recordings, and film. Typewriters, and eventually the computer based word processors and printers would allow people to put together and publish their own works at home. The 1990s saw the proliferation of digital multimedia with the expansion of the internet, which featured encoding text, images, animations, and sounds in unique and simple forms, hypertext, which further improved access to information, as well as the lowered production and distribution costs provided by the internet. Since we have examined the publishing of books past, let us now look to its future. Many felt that paperbacks would be the end of publishing, and that CD-ROMs would revolutionize the business. But what seemed to have the most weight was the prediction about ebooks. Ebooks first emerged in 1999 and were supposed to change everything. Printed books were on the way out. The publishing industry was going to be rocked to its foundation, but it didn't happen. Ebooks have still yet to take off in any real way. Print books still exist as they did in the late 1990s. Ebooks are still only a small part of the market, and consumer response and publisher participation has been cautious. In examining the problems with ebooks, many proponents of traditional print text feel that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what doomed ebooks were the early calls for change by various sectors to keep in mind the needs of readers. The technology developed was not anything readers were looking for, but instead were built on the dot-com boom mantra that, if you build it, they will come. There is also the question of the name. What is an ebook? Is it a format or a device? 
Is it a physical thing? A dedicated device that is just for reading books? Or a file like a Word or Excel document that can be downloaded to a portable device? Further problems with ebooks include the woefully small amount of titles initially available. Bookstores often carry up to 100,000 titles, while Amazon features well over a million. In the early 1990s, ebook stores only had 10,000 titles. Many readers experimented with e-reading but left because of lack of titles. Most consumers also felt that ebooks should cost less than their printed editions. Ebooks did not need to be manufactured or to be stored in a warehouse, as well as saving on paper. But publishers did not want to price the books so low that they would undercut the sale of their print versions. As of then, the iPod had yet to gain steam, and Napster had taught a generation content should be free. There was also the confusion with formats. Uh, this resembled the time of the VHS versus Beta cassettes. Readers had to choose between Rocket eBook, Softbook, Microsoft Reader, Palm Digital Reader, Moby Pocket, and Glassbook. Some were dedicated reading devices, and some were files meant to be read on a desktop or laptop, Palm Pilot, or cell phone. Further frustration came as the consumer was unsure of what an eBook even was. And finally, the all, there was also the question of digital rights management. A convoluted set of electronic rules put in place to protect the copyright owners of the material. What this means is that users who have bought the electronic book were not allowed to copy, print, or share the text, or could not even share with another one of their devices, let alone with someone who might be interested in the material. But they found different levels of DRM too constrictive. No restrictions were on what you could take and who you could share with. Publishers fear the Napsterization of publishing would be the downfall of their industry. But for the true lovers of traditional print texts, they felt that ebooks were not enough like regular books. However, as Jeff Gomez asserts, this is a misnomer. Early ebooks tried but failed because they were too much like books. The more they make them like real books, the more readers miss the originals. A lack of hyperlinks and search capabilities made info harder to find in ebooks than in actual books themselves. In trying to keep the vestiges of traditional books within ebooks only does two things inadequately than doing one thing well trying to be both a computer and a book and providing a new way to read. Though the question does still remain will books disappear? Demand for printed books, of course, will get smaller over the decades. But books will never go away. They will be sought out by collectors and those who want to touch pages and hold covers, and will always have a place in millions of homes. Books will turn into a specialized taste, an art form, and a continued portion of books will be printed for the specialized audience who will read them. But for publishers, though, in order to make ebooks work, must realize that they are not in the book making business, but they are in the business of ideas and stories. Just as videos and DVDs had little to do with film itself, uh, digital reading will prove to publishers that cardboard and pulp are merely the passing adjuncts to its most important process, and realize that words are special and that books are just paper.